A uh, lot of great questions today on Maximus Live 25. Um, we uh, just answered a question about, um, you know, how do you uh, prevent sort of uh, burning in the sun while still getting your vitamin D. Um, we uh, talked a little bit um, about uh, how do you deal with sort of sobriety when you're when you're sober versus your wife still likes to drink. Uh, and is sort of in social situations. We had a great question about how do I get into flow states consistently uh, over time? I had a question about how do you overcome procrastination and the feeling of anxiety when a goal is feeling really big? Um, and then I started out the conversation today talking about uh, the uh, weekly unpopular opinion of uh, when to not engage in sustainable change, but kind of go on a, a sort of a crash course uh, when it comes to changing any any particular behavior in order to transition to a more sustainable pattern of behavior. And there are sort of thoughtful ways of doing that. All right, welcome, welcome. It is Maximus Colin Radio Show number 25. It's a nice little quarter century milestone to have done our 25th show today. Super excited. And uh, as always, we always prioritize any questions that people are willing to uh, talk through live. So you are, if you are joining us on Discord, YouTube Live, uh, we got TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter Spaces, and Clubhouse. Uh, feel free to join us uh, and submit your questions. So uh, we always are starting out these days um, with uh, a little bit of uh, what I call our weekly unpopular opinion. So this week's unpopular opinion is about unsustainable change. So everyone sort of heard the adage when it comes to changing your health behaviors that you should uh, engage in sustainable change. I'm obviously a big proponent of that, but today I wanna to actually talk about when it actually makes sense to change in a way that's unsustainable. So whenever I talk about, for instance, people changing their diet, their exercise routine, I always tell people, look, figure out what you're willing to do and able to sustain long-term because that's gonna be the best diet plan, exercise plan, etc." Now here's the contrarian exception to that rule. When I was actually a grad student at UCLA, we had one of the preeminent uh, health psychologists come in and talk about um, some really interesting research about the use of sort of boot camps, right? So uh, these are programs for getting people to really turn around their lives, uh, engage in very rapid weight loss. Uh, you can kind of imagine like the TV show, Biggest Loser. Um, those kind of programs actually work very well for, um, an interesting reason in that a lot of the uh, changes that you make, especially when it comes to diet and exercise, you don't see the results. And so from a behavioral standpoint, you don't get the reward or the reinforcement, right? Because it takes kind of weeks or sometimes months to sort of see transformations occur. However, when you put someone in a very um, a highly structured environment, and they're cutting their calories pretty significantly, exercising for hours a day, they will see that change very quickly and drastically, right? So people can literally be uh, losing, you know, a pound a day versus a pound a week uh, on a more sustainable program. And while that's not sustainable, and we know there's actually data from uh, shows like The Biggest Loser in which people do regain some of the weight, um, the immediate reinforcement of seeing the change, seeing the pounds come off, uh, seeing that you're feeling and looking better, uh, often jump starts or catalyzes change in a way that's much more rewarding or reinforcing than uh, you know, the slow sustainable change. So the question becomes, you know, when do you sort of make that exception? So here's some useful rules of thumb. First of all, I never believe in sort of doing crash diets. Anything that involves sort of starvation or feeling hungry is obviously not sustainable. Uh, it sets up bad patterns of behavior. And some of the data that came back from, you know, the Biggest Loser study also suggests that, you know, if you go in too much of a caloric deficit, you may, um, uh, initiate like too much of a dysregulation in terms of your metabolism. Um, and so you don't want to like throw off your metabolism and do things like that. So don't, don't engage in some weird like celery juice diet or, or, or anything that's, that's clearly not sustainable. Um, however, I do think for instance, a, a very structured evidence-based boot camp um, can be very helpful for people um, in which they do like kind of like a 30 day challenge um, another great example of that, if you're dealing with addiction, is to go and do rehab, right? A lot of times people have a very hard time doing the slow, sustainable change while they're still in the context of their environment. 
and they still have all the triggers, all the temptations, all the people that encourage them to relapse. And so literally going away for a period of time, um, even though it's obviously not sustainable, they can't live at a residential facility forever, but you know, for a couple week period of time, it can be very helpful to restart or catalyze their change. So I, I think if you're particularly struggling uh, with sort of doing it the slow and steady way, um, changing your environment, doing something that's a little bit more drastic can be helpful for people as long as, like I said, it's not some crazy crash diet, but it's more of like a structured, well-researched program. You're supervised. There's people looking out for you. That can be very helpful. The second rule of thumb is I think um, unsustainable change can be uh, practical if there's a transition plan to sustainable change. So a really great example of that is actually uh, an Atkins or a low carb or a ketogenic diet, right? A lot of those programs are actually set up as transitionary plans. So for instance, you go on a very low carbohydrate diet, you're consuming less than 50 grams of total carbs a day. Um, you do that until you know, you're, you're getting the weight loss that you want. And once you're kind of hit your target weight, you start reintroducing carbohydrates back into your diet because it's really hard to like literally, you know, consume that low of amount. You reintroduce it back into your diet and then you start noticing at what point does your weight start going back up, right? Now that you're eating 100 grams of carbs or maybe 150 grams of carbs, you're like, oh, at 150, I start regaining weight. At that point, you're like, okay, maybe that's a little bit too much. You go back down to 100 and then you find that 100 basically is your magic sweet spot based on your own individual carbohydrate tolerance that allows you to maintain that weight loss. And so you're increasing your carbs, you're increasing your calories, and you're finding that sort of Goldilocks zone um, that is actually sustainable long-term. So that's actually how Atkins is set up. If you if you read Volek and Finney's research over at Verta Health that essentially has modernized this into the, uh, you know, what's called a well-formulated ketogen uh, ketogenic diet, it's the same thing. There's sort of like an induction phase, initiation phase, there's a transition phase and then there's a maintenance phase in which you keep it on forever. So as long as you understand that and that you're like, look, I'm not doing this sort of really unsustainable diet forever. Uh, this is when I'm going to transition. And this is something that's much more realistic to maintain. Then I think it is actually possible to do something that's a little bit more drastic. Obviously do that under, you know, proper medical supervision, proper clinical guidance, et cetera. Uh, but you can kind of do something that will kickstart or catalyze change uh, very much third very good example of that which is kind of related to the addiction kind of rehab that we were talking about is dopamine fasting right now in our squads we're actually doing a 30-day dopamine fasting challenge now why is it 30 days i don't know it's just a popular thing that people like to do these sort of time uh you know restricted sort of challenges and the idea is if you're dealing with something like a digital addiction um it can uh, serve as sort of a detox not literally obviously you're not detoxifying from any chemical but um it helps sort of uh, break uh, conditioned patterns of behavior, right? So for an example of this is if every time you are uh, uh, stressed, anxious, or bored, you reach for your phone and you pick it up and you do that very unconsciously, um, it helps break that pattern of behavior and saying, look, I'm not gonna check my phone uh, out of an emotional uh, impulse, right? I'm only gonna check my phone at a scheduled time instead of whenever it's emotionally driven. And when you start doing that and you say, okay, I'm only going to check my phone at, you know, let's say 15 minutes after uh, I eat uh, meals, that's, that's kind of my rule of thumb. Um, that way it breaks that sort of impulsive, emotionally avoidant sort of pattern of behavior. And if you do that for 30 days, it doesn't mean you need to do that forever for the rest of your life. It can be helpful in breaking that pattern of conditioning. Now that conditioning may still be latent in sort of the brain. It can, it can be re-triggered. That's something that we know about addiction, but it can help. Uh, reintroduce that sort of behavioral flexibility, which in my opinion is like basically freedom, right? You don't want to be driven just because of your emotions or out of impulse, uh, but you want to basically have the resilience to do what you want when you want. And doing sort of a, a kind of a, a very strict sort of 30 day challenge can be very hel helpful in sort of fixing problematic uh, behaviors, negative beha behavioral patterns that you've incurred and finding obviously ones that are healthier and more sustainable. So that's my uh, unpopular opinion of the week is although obviously long-term you do wanna find something that is you're willing to do and able to sustain forever for the rest of your life, there are certain instances in which you can kind of engage in a little bit more uh, drastic, uh, extreme sort of patterns of behavior, knowing that there's a transition plan to a more sustainable 
uh, pattern of behavior because you kind of need to get rid of old habits or you want to see that reward or that reinforcement a little bit faster, a little bit more upfront. Hey, Dr. Cam. Hey there. So I have a question regarding um, momentum and mm -hmm. um, if you have any frameworks, because I'm try I want to kind of build habits where I'm kind of in flow state where I'm not thinking about things. I'm kind of, you know, in flow. And yeah. um, so like kind of do you have any frameworks for momentum, that type of thing? Sure. Can you can you be a little bit more specific in terms of um, like what, what what are you trying to achieve here? What would be a what would be a good outcome for you? I don't know. I just think that um, for example, like in basketball, when you're mm -hmm. kind of in flow, like for example, Clay Thompson, he had that one game where he hit eleven threes. Amazing. Um, he's just like such in a flow state where everything's clicking, mm -hmm. and you're kind of like your mind and your body's connected. Yeah. I'm kind of maybe it's maybe a little bit more not very specific, but kind of generally like kind of getting into that mentality and that mindset. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the question is, um, it sounds like it's really about how do I get into flow states uh, more easily and more often, uh, which is a, a good kind of goal to have. So it may be helpful to first talk about for um, everyone listening what the concept of flow is. Uh, I think a lot of people have sort of an intuitive sense of what it is. Um, there's a lot of different names for it, right? Um, flow actually came from um, a fellow psychology colleague of mine, uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, uh, a tough last name to pronounce, but he's written some great books and a lot of um, great research on flow. And uh, Csikszentmihalyi essentially uh, defines flow, you could almost graph it as it's the intersection between, um, you know, your something uh, that's your, the, the intersection between the challenge and your ability level. So let's take the example of you, you, you mentioned Clay Thompson playing basketball, right? Now, if you played against uh, Clay Thompson or NBA player, um, no offense to your basketball abilities, I think I'm a pretty good basketball player, but if I played against an NBA player, I'm sure I would get demolished, right? These guys are uh, amazingly good. And so if you, like, imagine every single time that you tried to take a shot, they blocked it. Your skill development would not be very good because you couldn't even practice getting a shot off and you would not be in a flow state because you'd probably be uh, angry or humiliated or frustrated every time. Now, let's take the converse example. You're playing against a bunch of like six-year-olds and you're dunking all over them. Uh, that's obviously not going to be conducive to a flow state because it's going to be too easy, right? So you have to find that Goldilocks zone of um, your ability level has to meet the challenge level. Um, and that's when flow occurs. Generally, useful rule of thumb is you want to play against someone who is just as good if you, as you, if not slightly better. Uh, so it, it kind of pushes you towards that sort of growth zone. So that's a useful rule of thumb, by the way, regardless of whether you're doing sports or any sort of skill that you're trying to develop, is you want the difficulty level to essentially be medium or slightly higher than medium. And, and that's what Csikszentmihalyi says essentially is the most conducive to flow states. So that's, that's the most important rule of thumb that I would say is make sure that it's not too easy, it's not too hard either. You're really trying to go for medium to medium hard uh, is that, that sort of special zone that induces flow. And that's because it prevents you from getting overly frustrated and you're not seeing like we were talking about um, at the beginning of our conversation, you're not getting any reward or reinforcement when things are too hard because uh, you're not seeing any progress, you're not seeing any skill development, you're not seeing the nice swoosh uh, of the um, the basket. Like imagine if you started out playing basketball only taking uh, you know midcourt shots that are 50 feet away. You're going to make like one out of every 50. It's not going to be very reinforcing. Same thing if you're a foot away from the basket, you're going to probably make nine out of every 10. It's probably going to get pretty boring. Best thing to do is start out, take shoot free throws at 15 feet. You'll probably be making you know, 75% of them if you're a skilled basketball player. And that's the right amount of sort of reinforcement. Um, I would say if you're making three out of every four shots. So that's rule number one. Rule number two for being conducive to a flow state, I think is actually making sure that your environmental setup is conducive to flow. We live in an age of distraction, especially digital distraction. And so I, one of the things that I think is very helpful is actually purposely inducing uh, routine in order to condition and train your brain that it's time to go into a flow state. So let's let's talk about a concrete example of that. Let's say that you need to write 
writing is a great example of something where it really benefits from you being in a flow state. You got to get the creative juices going. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of output that you need to, to kind of get into a flow state. And so if I was trying to write on a consistent basis, because I'm a blogger, I'm a copywriter, or if you just want to, I don't know, journal and like practice your, your expression or your creative writing, I would set up a time and a place where you can do that uh, very, very consistently and routinely. So for instance, like if you read like Stephen King, one of the great writers of all time, he talks about, he has like a meticulous morning routine. He gets up at the same time, he gets to his desk at the same time, he has his coffee, he puts out 500 words before he goes and does anything else, right? And so that allows him to get into a flow state and I'd encourage the same for you. Now you gotta find what that is for you. Some people are more morning people based on their circadian rhythm. Some people are more night people uh, they're, you know, in terms of their rhythm and they, they like to you know, do both, most of their creative work in the evening. But whatever it is for you, be really consistent about it. And so you might say whether it's 8 to 9 a.m. or 8 p, uh, to 9 p.m., that's going to be your hour. Uh, that's when you're going to write. You're going to sit in the same chair and the same thing, put on the same music with the same drink. And uh, that will essentially over time, you're going to repeat that every single day, uh, create the kind of pattern of conditioning that you want in order to get into the flow state. Because what happens is let's say you do that four or five days in a row. Your body literally smells the aroma of the chamomile tea and knows how the chair feels underneath you. You're listening to your uh, Batman movie soundtrack that kind of gets you jazzed and in the mood to write. And so your brain is taking all this stimuli, right? The stimuli, auditory stimuli, the taste stimuli, smell stimuli, kinesthetic stimuli, and it's saying all with all five of your senses, oh, this is the time to write. This is the time for me to get into flow. And it, it'll slip right back into that state um, uh, easily and more quickly the more and more you do it. Now, the third part of it, though, is that you have to not mess up that stimuli by going and uh, allowing sort of the digital distractions to slip through. So if that 8 to 9 a.m. or p.m., whatever it is for you, is your sacred space to write and get into a flow state, absolutely do not let yourself get digitally distracted. You got to practice your dopamine fasting and say, I am not going to touch my phone during that hour. I am not going to go on social media for that hour. If I start feeling anxious or frustrated, I'm not going to go randomly get up and I don't know, distract myself or make an excuse uh, for why I'm not going to sit down and write these 500 words, right? That's why Stephen King's rule was I'm not going to go do anything until I finish those 500 words. Um, and so it's, you got to almost treat it like a sacred space, right? Like you know, a lot of people have the experience. You don't wear a ball cap when you're in a church or an auditorium. Uh, it's the same thing. You, 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 you treat it, you treat it as sacred and you don't defile it essentially by allowing impulsivity, distractions, other things to go through. Because if you do, you're going to ruin that conditioning that you've, you've so nicely sort of built up over time. And by the way, this is an exact basically parallel if you if you if you're kind of cluing into what i'm saying to sleep and sleep hygiene right so if you do a bedtime routine right like 15 minutes before you go to bed every night it's the same routine you brush your teeth you do your little you know whatever it is uh, that conditions your brain to say oh okay 9:45 to 10 p.m. it's time to go to sleep and then you go to sleep really well you want to not defile that by at 10 o'clock you slip into bed and you bust out your tiktok and you scroll through videos uh, you know uh, and stimulating yourself, overstimulating yourself, and then ruining the association of the bed with relaxation. That's why I always say the two things you should only be doing in bed is sex and sleep. You should not be distracting yourself with anything else so as to not ruin the association of the conditioning um, with bed. So that applies to flow as well. So anyway, to recap basically what I said in terms of here are the three rules for getting into flow. So number one, is make sure that the difficulty level of the task is at the medium difficult to medium hard level so that your ability level meets the challenge level. And obviously, as you get better and better at the task, you can increase the challenge, right? Uh, so that you're always kind of, um, you know, getting better. Example of this, Tucker Max, uh, I was actually talking about how when he played recreational basketball, there's almost like a couple different courts uh, outdoor courts and there was like sort of an easy court medium court and then the hard court where all the best players play and he kind of like kept practicing at the lower levels until he got better and better was able to move up to the more and more difficult courts 
so that his the challenge level met his ability level. Number two is really create um, the, the environment and the structure, the time and the place in which you're going to consistently try to get into a flow state um, and by doing it in almost like a very meticulous routine. Um, and that way your brain associates the sensory stimuli, the five senses, sight, sense, a sight, smell, taste, touch, etc., with getting into flow, like get sitting down at 8 p.m. with your cup of tea, doing your writing, etc. And then the third part is uh, avoiding distraction uh, and stimuli um, by dopamine fasting, not letting anything sort of sneak in, uh, not engaging in uh, distraction so as to not ruin or or defile sort of the conditioning that you sort of have created over time. So those are my three rules of thumb. Uh, put it into practice and, and hopefully you'll slip back into uh, flow easily, uh, quickly, and naturally the more you practice those things. It gets better and better over time. Perfect. Thank you so much. I have a one follow-up thing regarding yes, kind of the basketball analogy. So you were talking about um, – one of your friends kind of going from the easy court and working his way up to mm -hmm. the harder courts. Sometimes when I play basketball, I feel like when the competition is at its peak, yep. so maybe I'm more of a medium player or um, upper, like, you know, um, above average court. Sure. But when I, you play at the highest level, you play the best, but it might not mean that you score the most mm -hmm. or you get like the best stats. So what do you think about that where you're kind of performing, you know, above your Goldilocks zone, but you're not as effective individually, but you're kind of keeping up with the pace? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, this 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 is almost, an, you know, analogous to kind of what we were talking about at the beginning in terms of unsustainable change, right? Um, what I think sometimes pushing a little even beyond the Goldilocks zone can do temporarily is yeah you, you know you, you, a lot of uh, professional players see this that they're, they're fantastic they dominate at the college level they go in the nba and they become sort of like bench warmers they might you know get a few minutes uh, a few buckets a game but they're not sort of getting a lot of minutes not getting a lot of exposure um as long as i would say um it's not uh, uh coming at the de detriment of skill development so what i mean by that is let's say you're playing at, a, uh, at that level but you're not touching the ball um, then at that point, I would say you're not probably developing a ton of skill. Now, if you're able to like make it up by at least playing in practice all the time with the top players, then maybe it makes up for it, even if you're not getting sort of game time, so to speak. But um, if you if you are able to, you know, at least get a decent amount of touches, you know, uh, play against top level people, it may be at the beginning a little bit unsustainable, like we're talking about. But it might accelerate or catalyze your development and, and level you up quicker. Right. And that maybe it's like a little bit beyond uh, kind of where you need to be, but you're going to get better quickly enough that you become one of those sort of top court players over time. So I think it is absolutely OK if you're still able to hang uh, and you feel like you're getting better and you're getting enough touches, then I think it's fine to push yourself and you should push yourself. Um, and it doesn't always have to be like five percent beyond where you are, if it's 10, 20 percent beyond where you are, but you start catching up and you start closing that gap then i think it's fine to do perfect that's an awesome analogy and i was just thinking about that analogy specifically kind of like with the bench warmer example like could they like their nba talent but they could probably play in euro mm -hmm. in the euro league and start and eventually move over to the nba once they kind of progress their goldilocks sound so it's kind of like the trade-off between okay are you playing at the highest level but you might not get the most individual output right or you could go somewhere maybe come more comfortable with your goldilocks zone that's kind of like that you know a little bit above average pushing your um performance and then eventually move it up so that's super interesting but thank you so much uh super helpful with you know the action items regarding uh, flow state and kind of building momentum thank you yeah and you know a lot of people have this experience if they've ever done like high school or college athletics right um, it's hard to get varsity playing time when you're not great, especially like, you know, you're young, you're 14 year old freshman, you're not even fully developed. Um, and you, you might be able to like sneak onto the varsity team, maybe as a, as a freshman or a sophomore. Um, but you're other than, like I said, the, maybe, maybe you'll get a lot of skill development just from practice, but you're not getting a lot of playing time, which let's put the ego aside. Playing time is actually valuable too, because there's something to be learned about playing under a high pressure situation with everyone's eyes on you when it really counts. 
right? So I actually do think it's very useful to, for folks, go play on the junior varsity team, get a lot of minutes in, uh, and maybe uh, even sometimes even slightly below sort of your level of skill development, um, get really good, and then you can make the leap, you can make the transition to varsity, but now you have game time experience with pressure, you know, uh, when points actually count, and then make that transition. So um, I don't think there's always like a perfect answer to when it's you go a little too easy, when you go a little hard. You have to just, it depends on the circumstances. Um, but, I, but I think uh, you should always be kind of stretching yourself to some degree. One, one last note, by the way, on flow, and I have a very contrarian opinion about this. Flow is actually always characterized, at least in the popular media, as a positive thing, right? So like Chicks Mihai and all these other folks talk about you should try to maximize the amount of um, flow that you're in in your everyday life, like it's some magical state. I actually don't agree with this at all as a psychologist um, because I think there's both positive and negative flow. Um, and, uh, and I'll explain what the difference is. Flow to me is basically trance. And trance is a natural phenomenon that all of us slip in and out of that is essentially hyper-focus. Right? Hyper focus is when something is engaging enough that it captures and it sustains your attention. Right Now the problem is there's a lot of things that are designed, especially because of technology, to be very captivating of your attention. I would argue video games, uh, social media, all these things are designed by the best technologists and behaviorists in the world to put you into a flow state. Right, like when you're on social media or you're playing a video game, like your kid is totally in flow. You ever seen a kid playing video games? The mom's calling them to come grab lunch or dinner, and the kid barely is aware of it. Right, the the auditory stimuli is hitting his ear, but he's so hyper focused and engaged on the video game that it's not even like really registering because he's he's he, like literally in a trance. Right, so I wouldn't argue that's positive flow because what if you're spending hours a day you know, essentially in a flow or trance state playing video games and it's not advancing you as a human being, it's not advancing your life. That I would consider negative flow because it's taking you further away from your values, even though psychologically, maybe even physiologically, you are in a flow or trance state, right? Like the video game is hard, right? It's like that, that Goldilocks zone of challenge meets ability levels. And that's how video games are, right? You keep playing and you get, you know, goes from easier to harder and harder as you sort of progress. Right? They're designed essentially to put you into that Goldilocks zone very quickly and keep you there as long as possible. As opposed to a positive flow state, now you're like, okay, I want to play basketball because it's aligned with my values. Maybe you have a value around enhancing your health. Maybe you have a, a value around you know, the great social aspect of playing on a team, hanging out with your buddies. That's why I play basketball. Like I, to me, I, I, I don't do it to work out. I, do, I lift weights to work out and do sprinting and other things. For me, basketball, is, it's really more fun and social. It hits those values of like uh, for me, um, and so I, I do get into a flow state playing basketball, and it is values aligned. So that's the thing I would encourage everyone. It's you don't need to be flow in flow twenty four seven. It's actually I think useful to go from a hyper focused state to actually a little bit more of like an open awareness kind of state. That's why, for instance, I highly recommend sort of taking breaks in between meetings. Right? If you think about it, a, a professional work meeting is a flow state. You got to focus on your little Zoom meeting for whatever it is, 50 minutes. Uh, you have to be highly engaged, attentive, uh, empathic, etc. And then what I do is I literally get up, 10 minutes, I go for a walk, and I'm not focusing on a particular point, right? So as opposed to hyper-focusing on a particular point, I'm just letting my awareness sort of drift. I'm going for a walk. I'm noticing the birds. I'm noticing the trees. I'm noticing the sunshine letting it kind of come and go in my attention. So you're kind of going from a narrow point of attention to expansive point of attention. And then when I come back after that 10 minute walk, I go back to that point of hyper-focus. So in a lot of ways, it's literally like high intensity interval training for your mind, right? So high intensity interval training, you go from sprinting to walking to sprinting to walking uh, back and sort of forth. It's the same thing with your focus. You can literally do the same thing with your focus where you go from hyper-focus to kind of a, you know, lax focus, hyper focus, lax focus. And that allows your kind of attention and concentration to not get exhausted. You cannot like sustain your attention really for more than I would say 50 to 70 minutes max. Like if you're a normal kind of person and you're not on sort of stimulant drugs um, without your attention sort of fading. So just as we sort of do interval training for your body, I think you can literally do interval training for your mind. And that allows you to 
slip in and out of flow in a way that's more sustainable um, than just trying to focus for hours on end. It just it just doesn't really work very well. Um, so that's kind of my, my tip for, you know, pay attention to make sure you're not slipping into too many negative flow states that takes you away from the things that are important to you in life uh, and also sort of use sort of this interval training method, uh, methodology or process uh, in order to just keep your attention and your concentration sharp uh, so that you can sustain it over the course of a work day. And in my opinion, most people only get about four hours of real work done every day. If you use this sort of interval uh, focus, I think you can actually get eight, eight hours of real work done. But that means you're going to work eight hours out of maybe 10 hours that you're there with two hours being the breaks that you've kind of woven in between your meetings or in between your sort of deep work. That's awesome. Uh, that's like with the interval kind of method and then also like how to eliminate, you know, the bad flow with, you know, dopamine fasting and then like focusing on how to leverage good flow at periods of times blocked out thank you so much that's super helpful i'm gonna kind of think about this how to implement it thank you my pleasure great 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 questions we have a question via youtube how to overcome feelings of procrastination if the goal seems extremely huge and far away yeah great question so the question is about how do you how do you deal with procrastination when you have this huge goal so first of all let's actually clarify something i hate to be yeah nitpicky Procrastination is not a feeling. Procrastination is a behavior. It's a pattern of behavior that's driven by the avoidance of negative feelings, right? So most of the time, um, uh, it's, it's driven by anxiety um, and sort of a sense of perfectionism that people have in which they, they feel like if they fail or they're not able to do the task adequately, they're not going to be okay with themselves. And thus, they're going to beat themselves up and feel uh, feelings of low self-worth, shame, guilt, etc. So that's what drives sort of procrastination. So um, the first thing that you have to do is, okay, you can kind of almost sense just from your question where the anxiety is coming from. You say the goal is very huge. So obviously the first thing you should do is break that goal up into much smaller chunks. So you may have a goal of saying, I wanna spend four years getting this degree, fantastic. But if you think about all, all the coursework and all the tests and all the essays that you have to write, that will be very intimidating and it just feels overwhelming. Right, so break it down and say, what do I gotta do first? I gotta register for some classes this semester and that's all I'm gonna focus on and you know, take it step by step. So you know, this is classic sort of goal planning 101 is break it down into the smallest bite-sized chunks that you can. Now you can think about, okay, what do I need to do at the end of my first year, second year, third year, fourth year in order to graduate on time? That's fine to do, but you wanna really take it to the proximal level of like, what do I need to do now, what do I need to do today? Maybe what do I need to do this week? Um, and then that makes it feel much less overwhelming. There's a great book that uh, on this, you know, a lot of graduate students have to write, uh, especially if you're in a doctoral program, you're doing a PhD, you have to write a dissertation. Dissertations can be like 100 plus pages and it takes years to write and it's this very sort of overwhelming thing. And so there's a great book and it's like, write your dissertation in 15 minutes a day. I remember I picked it up at the Harvard Coop, which is like the, the bookstore um, in Cambridge for Harvard. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? How can you write this like multi-year, hundred, multi hundred page kind of thing in 15 minutes a day? And it's based on this exact principle of like, look, you break it down to the smallest chunk. And the smallest chunk for a lot of people can honestly be 15 minutes. And it's not, you don't even need to specify the task. It's always better if you do, but just getting into that frame of time, frame of mind of I'm gonna do something small, it's less intimidating. And so there's less of this inertia to overcome uh, regarding it. So that's the first thing that I would say. Uh, and the second thing, I'll, I'll just kind of, th there's a lot we can talk about dealing with procrastination, but I'll give you something very concrete that you can implement today in order to be very practical. Um, this, this is a technique that comes from Dr. Neil Fury. Um, by the way, he has a great book. I actually highly recommend it. I think it's the best book and resource on procrastination. It's called The Now Habit. So if you want a guide to overcoming procrastination, read The Now Habit. That's, that's the best uh, recommendation I can give you. But one technique that comes from that is, uh, it's called a centering exercise. And so a centering exercise um, can also be used to help get you into flow as we were talking about. And so he has basically an, a, a, an exercise. Um, it's basically a four part breathing exercise in which you take three breaths in four parts. And what you do is you take three breaths and the idea is you actually kind of suck in your gut, 
you tense and tighten the muscles of your abdomen. And what that does is it essentially mimics the stress response. It mimics the anxiety that you're feeling about how overwhelming this task is. And then you exhale, let go uh, of that stress response. And then you, you do this three times to let go of thoughts around the past, right? So you're like, oh my God, I remember procrastinating on this essay and how terrible it was to stay up all night uh, you know, previously. So you do that three times, you let go of the, the thoughts of the past. You do it three more times to let go of any thoughts that you have about the future. Oh, this is not gonna go well. Oh, I'm gonna fail my exam. Oh, this presentation at work is not gonna go well. You're gonna let go of all the thoughts of the past. You're gonna take three more breaths. And then with those breaths, come into the present moment, right? So you're let, letting go of the past, you're letting go of the future, and now you're becoming centered in the present moment, in the here and now, uh, being able to uh, be uh, mindful. And then you take three breaths to get the just right amount of attention and energy to do whatever it is that you need to do. So if it's sit down and do work, you might want to take those three breaths to kind of like inhale, get charged up, feel the amount of energy and be able to hit the ground running. Or if you say, say you're doing this to transition into relaxation or sleep, you may wanna take those last three breaths in order to wind down, lower your energy levels, uh, kind of diffuse your kind of attention uh, away from flow uh, and be able to let your mind drift off into a nice, peaceful, uh, relaxed state and go to sleep. So essentially it's 12 breaths, three to let go of the past, three to let go of the future, three to become centered in the present moment, and then three to have the just right amount of attention and energy to do whatever it is that you need to do. So that those 12 breaths can be done in about 30 to 60 seconds. And Neil, Dr. Fiore, recommends doing this uh, whenever you're transitioning from one task to the other. So just like as I was saying, transitioning from a Zoom meeting to a break, you might wanna do that exercise uh, to kind of you know get out of a uh, kind of a flow state. And also you can use it to get back into a flow state. Oh, I went for my walk, now I gotta come back, I gotta be attentive to this meeting. It's a very helpful sort of centering exercise uh, because it will help you uh, deal with any of the anxiety that you have kind of breathe it out and then be able to have the right energy, attention, focus in order to start the task. Uh, so that's the most important thing is, is you gotta just start when it comes to procrastination. The more that you avoid procrastination, the more the anxiety builds up, right? So that's, the, that's why it's so helpful, like I was talking about with writing, when you sit your butt down in the chair, you gotta just start. Like if your goal is to write 500 words, it's very easy to sit there and be like, I gotta sharpen my pencil, let me go fix my, clean my mouse, <laughs> like all, all the things that you're doing to avoid doing it. It's better to go put out five words of those 500 words, and then you can go do all the little things, but at least just get started. And the centering exercise is a very helpful way to kind of put you in the right uh, mind, body state, psychophysiologically in order to uh, just get started, right? It's only 30 to 60 seconds, so I don't consider it too much of a departure, or too much of a delay, uh, but it just kind of gets you into that right sort of frame of mind uh, mind body in order to start. So that's the best uh, tip that I can give you in terms of overcoming your procrastination. If you want more, we can talk more about it, but you should also read The Now Habit, which has a lot of extensive, uh, more extensive methodology for dealing with procrastination. So we have a user submitted question from last week. Uh, he says, I have been married for 13 years. I got sober three years ago. My wife still drinks. I struggle from her drinking, not because I might drink, but because her social life is all about drinking and that is not a part of who I am. Thoughts? Um, so gr great question. It sounds like the question is really about um, how do you deal with sort of the, the, the challenging social aspect of dealing with, um, you know, problematic drinking when you're sober, but you're still around people that aren't. And it's obviously someone you can't get away with because it's your wife. So, um, First of all, congratulations on being sober for three years. That is a serious accomplishment. I used to do a lot of work with, um, you know, uh, you know, addiction and, and rehab, and that is a, a not an easy thing to do. So, so congratulations on maintaining your sobriety. Uh, I just want to call that out. Um, so, uh, and you know, it's even more challenging to be able to do that when you're still around people. So a lot of people, for instance, when they go to AA, or I, I prefer kind of smart recovery as sort of a evidence-based um, 
non-religious version of AA, by the way. Um, I think it's smartcovery.org if you're interested in, in that. And there's uh, online meetings all the time. Yeah, you know, one of the first things that they recommend to people is to kind of get away from, um, you know, uh, people, places, situations that are uh, likely to trigger relapse. Now, in your particular case, your wife still drinks. And like I said, you obviously can't, can't and shouldn't uh, get away from your wife, obviously, if you want to maintain your relationship. And it sounds like this is obviously something that you struggle, struggle with. Now, the good news is it sounds like you maintain your sobriety for three years. And so it doesn't sound like her drinking is necessarily going to trigger your relapse, at least so far. So I'm glad that you've been able to um, maintain that. But it says, you know, you, you kind of mentioned that her social life is all about sort of drinking. And that's not sort of part of who you are. So what I kind of interpret from your question is it sounds like there's a little bit of a a values clash, right? In that she's not necessarily bringing down your health, but it sounds like partly you're concerned about hers, right? I'm sure you're feeling much healthier uh, being sober for three years. And obviously, hopefully you'd want that from your partner as well in terms of you want her to be healthy, happy, and for you to have a long uh, relationship together. So, you know, I, I think it it's, might be worth part of, um, you know, a kind of a deep conversation that you have with her um, you know, talking about the benefits, obviously, that you've had and why you're concerned about sort of her problematic drinking. Um, you know, obviously, you can't sort of push or make anyone do anything against their will, even if you are their significant other. But I think if it comes from a place of deep caring and concern, right, um, about her well-being, and this is this is especially true in, your, in, in uh, this case, right? It's really about her more than it is about you. Um, I think if you express that, hopefully that can be some sort of catalyst or instigation for change. Second part of it is it's really tricky because you've kind of noted that for her, her social life is all about that. And, you know, that's true. Unfortunately, in modern society, especially, I would say a lot of cultures, including American culture, uh, drinking is part of the social fabric, right? In fact, in certain cultures like Japanese culture, if you don't drink in a business context, you're considered untrustworthy. Right. They're like, what? Oh, like, what is this person holding back? They're not willing to drink with us. That's how embedded sort of, alco you know, alcohol and, um, you know, drinking is into our culture. And so it's very hard to go out and not drink in certain social situations because of sort of the peer social pressure, obviously. And it's kind of sad that you think that beyond college that that's not true. But unfortunately, it is. I have to say, I, I think there is slowly becoming a transition point, I think, especially amongst Gen Z, millennial, um, there's still a lot of drinking, don't get me wrong, but I think there's an increasing acceptance of people who don't drink and it's not the people who are just sober, right? Back in the day, if you went to a bar and you like, you know, you just want like a club soda with lime, bartenders will always, by the way, do that non-judgmentally because they know that there's a lot of alcoholics in recovery that absolutely cannot drink. But the assumption was basically that, oh, you're in recovery, right? You're basically an alcoholic. That's why you don't drink. That's the only legitimate social reason not to drink or you're religious, right? Like you're, you know, you're, you're Muslim or something like that. And you're, you're, you're not able to, to drink because of religious or cultural reasons. I think there was really an emergence of a third pattern of behavior, which is now there's just like people who for health reasons uh, don't drink. I always talk about actually there's no amount of alcohol that's safe. It's, that's what the evidence shows. It's basically a carcinogenic. It's not good for you. Um, and so for health reasons, you may uh, want to do that. And also for psychological reasons in that, um, you know, uh, alcohol is basically a substance that reduces anxiety uh, temporarily, uh, but it's an avoidance behavior. Um, and although it does make people feel more loose and limber, it really is not, uh, it's really contraindicated, as we like to say. Uh, in terms of dealing with anxiety. Like when I have people practice exposures to get over their social anxiety, rule number one is you are not allowed to numb yourself with alcohol or drugs. Because if you do, it interferes with the learning that's necessary in order for the exposures to work. Like you should actually go into social situations, feel anxious and be able to practice tolerating it, increase your willingness to have it. And you need to be sober to do that. So that's hard though. It, it really takes a high degree of motivation in order to do that. And that's why I was talking about, it's really it maybe helpful for you to talk about your values with your wife, right? If you have a value around health, value about a long-term sustainable relationship, that's what makes 
the discomfort of sitting there in a social situation feeling anxious worthwhile. That's what makes having a conversation with her friends about why she's not drinking and they are worthwhile. There has to be something that makes it worthwhile. But it ha she has to find that for herself. I think you can obviously like introduce it, you can encourage it, you can provide all the love and support that you can, but ultimately she has to make her own decision about it. Because she's an autonomous you know, human being. Now you obviously have you, the leverage that you have is is you know your relationship. Now, if if someone in a partnership is acting in a way that's clearly damaging to themselves, you know, I I really do think that especially if you're talking about marriage, I I, I do believe in the like till death do us part through sickness and in health. And I think sick addiction is a sickness. It's an it's a, it's an illness, and we should really try to support our loved ones as they go through addictions as much as we can. Um, and it's not an easy thing to do. You have to find what your line is, what your boundary is. Obviously it's like damaging you, it's damaging your children. Um, you know, there is, there is a point at which you decide this is not sustainable in terms of our relationship and, and you want out. But I think at least the default in trying to encourage someone with your own love and support, obviously encourage someone to get their own treatment because you can't be the treatment provider if you're their husband. Um, you know, they may need more resources and support than, than you can provide. Um, you know, I think it's, it's best to encourage it and support it and, and practice a lot of patience, practice a lot of willingness on your part. Um, cause it does take a long time. I'm sure you have that experience. You didn't give me the backstory of how you got the three years of sobriety, but I'm sure you had your sort of ups and downs. And, you know, uh, I always talk about, at least when it comes to things like smoking, people on average take, uh, I believe, uh, eight attempts to quit. Um, right. So they fail a whole bunch of times before they get to, uh, you know, so the sobriety that you mentioned, and I think alcohol is probably the same. Um, so those, those are sort of my thoughts is to, to kind of recap, you know, uh, have a, have an honest heart to heart conversation with her about why, you know, you're seeing it as problematic, how that relates to your values around sort of health and your relationship. Um, obviously try to get her support and resources if she is willing to change. If not, then, you know, you gotta be patient and, and hang around the hoop, so to speak until she's, uh, uh, you know, it moves along her willingness to change um, and gets gets to that point. But, you know, I think the good news is, is you're, it sounds like you're a good role model, right? You've achieved your sobriety for three years. Um, and hopefully that can provide a positive template for her to move along her sort of change continuum and, and hopefully follow in your footsteps. So best of luck with that. Not an easy thing to contend with, um, but it's absolutely worthwhile in terms of, you know, uh, maintaining a, a, a healthy relationship. This is a good question. I'll, I'll actually read this one. Um, do you think equivocating in conversation such as fillers with um, uh, kind of, et cetera, is indicative of low T related lack of confidence? Uh, if that's the case, I guess I have low T. <laughs> um, no. Uh, well, I will tell you, uh, I, my testosterone is very high. It's probably in the 99th percentile right now. Um, and I still use filler words. So it has nothing to do with uh, testosterone. Um, the re for, there's a couple reasons people use filler words and I'll tell you why I use filler words. I generally find it, it is, it does have to do with a little bit of nervousness. Like when I do these, these podcasts, um, usually when I'm starting out, I notice I have less verbal fluency because you know, I need to get kind of going and get into the, the flow as we were talking about. And so there's more filler words at the beginning versus the end of these, these, uh, kind of conversations. Also, when you're talking about things that you know about and you, you, there's a clear train of thought and you have your points, you're less likely to use filler words. But a lot of time, literally, literally people use it to buy time. You're, you're searching for your next thought. You're searching for your next point. And so it's the, you're buying time essentially when you're doing it, um, just like I did right now. So it is, it is just kind of a bad unconscious habit. Um, there is a good app though that I recommend to people. It's called Orai, O-R-A-I. You can record yourself when you're speaking and it'll uh, document the amount of times that you're using those filler words so that you can practice obviously eliminating them from your speech. So yeah, I would say that that's the reason why um, I don't think it has anything to do with testosterone. I think it really has to do with uh, not knowing exactly what you're saying next and some anxiety and you know a conditioned pattern of behavior it's not really more complicated than that but it is remediable um but it just takes a lot of like recording and practice and hearing yourself talk and uh you know undoing essentially just a bad habit we had a user submitted question from last week this is a good short sweet one that i wanted to get to 
How do you recommend getting enough vitamin D from the sun for pale people? If I don't wear sunscreen, I burn. The struggle is real. I feel you, brother. Uh, the struggle is real for, for our uh, non-melaninated uh, uh, friends, uh, if that's sort of the right word, if you don't have enough melanin in your skin to naturally tan. So here's rule number one. There's a, there's a huge debate going on right now about whether you should use sunscreen. Um, obviously, if you go from to the traditional medical camp, like you ask any dermatologist, they're going to say, of course, you should wear sunscreen. Are you out of your mind? Like people get melanomas, and skin cancers. You should just slather yourself in sunscreen all the time. If you listen to the crazy right wing bodybuilder a faction of Twitter uh, with their random anonymous accounts, they, they make it sound like sunscreen is the devil. Um, and the reason for that is, is not totally implausible. Um, there is research that shows that the chemicals from common chemical sunscreens do seep into your system. Um, and we don't really know the effects of those, but it is circulating sort of systemically. Um, and so, you know, maybe it might be sort of carcinogenic. Um, and so, you know, as I think about sort of any drug, right, or any sort of treatment that you have, you have to weigh the cost benefit analysis of it. So when it comes to sun exposure, rule number one, this should apply for everyone, is never ever burn. Never, ever burn. You never, ever want to burn because there's very clear research that shows that literally every time you burn, you increase your risk of skin cancer, right? So if you're getting red, you're getting blistered, you should avoid that under all circumstances. So how do you do that? Obviously, just avoid the sun if you sunburn easily. Uh, use physical blockers, use t-shirts, hats, etc. That's the uh, uh, go into the shade. Uh, and then third, uh, you can obviously use, you know, sunscreen as well. So to me, the, the chemical trade-off of sunscreen is worth it versus burning because there's maybe some long-term negative effects of sunscreen. It's unclear, but it's clear that there's both acute and long-term effects from sunburning. So you should never do that. General sun, uh, uh, sunscreen recommendations. I prefer physical sunscreen versus chemical sunscreen. The difference is uh, physical sunscreen uses uh, uh, minerals like zinc. Zinc is pretty natural. Even if it absorbs into your system, it's a healthy thing. Um, and But the problem is it's a physical blocker. Like it's, it, it creates a white tint on your skin that doesn't look aesthetically pleasing. So the problem is even physical sunscreens, they have to mix other chemicals into it so you, that you don't get that like white uh, 1980s lifeguard look um, on your face. But... Um, you know, th that's sort of the, the trade-off. Um, I actually do recommend sunscreen for the face and the neck. And the reason for that is honestly aesthetic and cosmetic. We know from uh, excess sun exposure prematurely ages the skin. You're going to have darker skin. You're going to have more wrinkles. You're going to have more sunspots. You're going to have more moles from uh, chronic sun, sun exposure. And obviously the part that people are looking at more often is your face and your neck. So I think everyone should just wear sunscreen on their face and neck uh, and use hats uh, and, and other things to shield excessive sun damage if you want to look good for as long as you can. Uh, and I think it's just a great idea. Now, on the other hand, your body, because uh, you know most people aren't kind of staring at your naked body all the time. Uh, I actually don't apply sunscreen personally. This is my kind of personal opinion and choice. Um, but what I do is I, I, I will burn too if I, because uh, I'm kind of light skinned naturally. Um, if I just jump out in the sun or on the beach in the midday for an hour. So what you want to do is very, very gradually expose yourself to the sun without burning. So if you're very pale skinned, that literally may be one minute you go outside, you know, expose your shirtless self, and then you, you that's it for the day. Maybe the second day you do a minute and a half, third day you do two, and you just kind of calibrate. I don't know what that right number is for you because it depends on where you are, what time of day, how quickly you burn, all those factors, right? But you just kind of watch it. Just do it through trial and error and slowly increase your sun exposure. And what happens is you develop a tan. What is a tan? The tan is your body's natural defense mechanism against uh, UV damage, right? And so as you kind of develop a base tan, it becomes more and more of a sun protection that prevents you from burning. So even people, I'm actually like really light skin. If I don't get sun exposure in the winter, I'm like super pale. Right now I'm very tan because I've gradually kind of, uh, you know, living in LA, get, get sun exposure over a, a while, and now I don't really burn, right? So that's what I would say is just very gradually kind of get sun exposure. 
Very useful app to help you do this is an app that I recommend all the time. It's called D Minder, like D Reminder. You can download it, it's free. I believe it's on iOS and Android. It figures out where you are based on your GPS coordinates. It knows the time of day and it'll tell you uh, how strong the UV is on like a one to 11 scale. And then on based on that, it'll tell you how much time can you go out without burning. Um, and so it'll say like, don't spend more than 25 minutes in the midday. If it's obviously late afternoon, there's not a lot of UV, you could be out there for hours. Right. By the way, traditionally, this is a very interesting rule of thumb. Hunter gatherers who are outside all the time, hunter gatherer societies actually try to avoid midday sun, right? They'll nap, they'll kind of hang out in the shade because they know the sun is intense and it burns uh, and it, can, it uh, has sort of negative side effects. But I think they do that because they're out all day, right? Eight, 10, 12 hours. And so they're getting enough vitamin D from just the rest of the time. It can be a little bit of the opposite for us city dwellers in the sense that I'm indoors most of the day. And so I will purposely try to uh, concentrate my, my sun exposure. Like I'll go for a 20 minute walk uh, during my lunch break at 12 and one shirtless. It is very high UV. Um, but like I said, I built enough of a base tan. I quickly get about four or 5,000 IUs of vitamin D. Uh, and then I quickly go back inside and I'm not getting any sun exposure for the rest of the day. So this is a great example of the, the unsustainable kind of uh, conversation that we had. Um, you obviously don't wanna do both. You, you don't wanna get like sun exposure all day, including midday, that might be too much sun exposure. You'll either burn or, or, or um, have sort of negative side effects from that. But I think you can kind of either do one or the other. You get sun exposure without the midday or you get a very short burst of midday sun and it'll tell you right the right, right amount of vitamin D to get. Um, uh, you know, if you are very pale, um, and you, or you have a, uh, you know, high amount of moles, you have a family history of skin cancer, you're high risk. You may want to not engage in, in that sort of pattern of behavior because your risk is essentially too high for those people. I would say supplement vitamin D, uh, synthetically, uh, you're going to get the benefits of vitamin D without the risk of skin cancer. And especially like, you know, uh, people didn't necessarily live to 80 to hundred and, and get the accumulated damage of the sun. Um, so I think it's actually, this is the one area where, you know, supplementation may be a smarter long-term strategy for those folks. So don't necessarily feel a pressure if you can't sort of build a base tan cause you're too, too pale, um, that you necessarily need to. But if you're like lightly melanated, you can develop a tan without burning it may not be a bad idea because there are some unique benefits to sun exposure that you can't get from supplementation. The two most important being it resets your circadian rhythm. So it helps you sleep. And the second is it does lower your blood pressure through a mechanism that is independent of vitamin D. So uh, I think the best comp thing, at least if you don't burn, is to do both. I try to get natural sun exposure, natural vitamin D that my skin produces. I also supplement uh, as well in order to get into optimal levels and sort of you kind of get the best of both worlds, both natural and artificial. Great questions. Uh, feel free to join us next week if you have other additional questions. We're on every single Thursday, 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific time on uh, basically every single social media channel. You can always submit your questions in advance. I'll try my best to answer them. But if you're willing to obviously ask it live, um, I'll always love dialoguing with you all. So um, I will have uh, show notes after the show. If you join our Discord, um, for folks who are not on Discord, uh, join discord.maximustribe.com. I'll put in links to resources that I mentioned that are helpful, including Dr. Neil Fiore's great book, The Now Habit, in order to deal with procrastination the D minder app that you can use to calculate, you know, the right amount of sun exposure to get vitamin D without burning, uh, and other great resources that I mentioned. So thank you everyone. Great show today. Hope you have a wonderful week, uh, and see you all online.